we're so glad you joined us online this morning. Will you sing with us as we open with this hymn? Hey there! Welcome to Tulare Community Church Online. We're so glad that you joined us for this worship experience. Thank you for being flexible as we have done our very best to navigate this fluid situation. For the next two weeks, we're going to be blending our Christian tradition of New Testament house churches with modern technology. We hope that you've taken advantage of this opportunity and invited a small group of friends and family to join you in your home for this service today. This service will be a bit different from our normal gatherings and even a bit different than what you would normally see from our sermon videos posted online after a service from one of our campuses. We as a staff have worked hard in a short time frame to make sure that all of the components of the service translate through the screen in the best way possible. From worship to prayer to our interactive teaching time, we hope you enjoy this time of worshiping our Lord together today. As a reminder, all TCC events have been postponed for the next two weeks. Look to your email and our social media pages for information on our response to this ever-changing situation in the days and weeks to come. Now, wherever you are, let's stand and worship together. Take it away, worship team.
short prayer. Uh, President Trump has called the nation to prayer. Certainly uh, uh, most appropriate response to what we're going through uh, these days, but any any day really, and certainly our response. And I'm um, going to encourage you, uh, as I am through the message, is that at any point, just hit pause, and you can have a prayer time uh, specifically for what's going on in your life and the lives of uh, those friends of yours and uh, those who are hard up against it. So, uh, but let me just lead us in a short prayer. So, Father God, thank you that, again, that we can worship you in the face of challenging places, for sure. Again, declare your victory and uh, that we're going to walk in it. We thank you for your promises to us, Lord, that as we, as we come up against hard things in our life, that you are with us. We know you are with us now. Find us faithful to stay close uh, to you, Lord. And I just, again, thank you so very much for... Uh, a nation, again, where there's freedom to pray and that in this day we can gather with many from around our nation uh, praying uh, for that which impacts us all, uh, not only in our, our nation but throughout uh, the world. And so, again, for just a few moments, Father, we would want to lift up those who are infected already uh, by this uh, coronavirus. Pray for them. Pray for their health. Pray for 
their protection. Father, we pray for protection and peace. Those who are living in anxiety right now, I pray that we and they would find their peace in you and in your promises and in your presence. Lord, we pray for wisdom for our governmental authorities and agencies, everyone who's working and making decisions. Lord, we, we lift them up for your wisdom and pray that as you promise in James 1. Father, we pray for energy and protection for our health care workers, all of those who are really working so hard um, in the face of this. And then, Father, for believers and missionaries and nations where the pandemic conditions are already in full force, pray that you would protect them, but also give them many opportunities as they step out in faith and, and courageously and are part of uh, part of the solution. Then we pray for us, Lord, for our leadership and uh, for each one of us as we walk through this, that we would be able to navigate it uh, faithfully, in faith, not in fear, and that you would give, them, give us the wisdom that you promise. Uh, Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And then at this time, another thing you might want to um, uh, have a conversation with, with those in your sphere of influence and those in your little house worship time right now is, is what does it mean to be a, a, a generous person? What, what is about um, giving? What, what do you, why do you give to the Lord? This is kind of the time of offering, and we pass the plates and such, and, or do a, or a, a, a text to give, or put something in an envelope and send it. But uh, this is a time that you could discuss, even with your kids. What, you know, why is that? Why, why would you want to give, and what are you hoping, and what are you praying? And then pray over that as you consider that as well today. Uh, blessings to you. Okay, so here we are for the, the message time. It's, uh, this is so unique uh, uh, to me. I'm right here in a green room, <laughs> just Shane. And so I'm preaching to Shane today. But actually, I can, you know, if we're in North Campus, I can kind of see my front row people there. And the lights are pretty bright, so it's kind of hard to see who's where. South Campus, I can really see you. It, it just It's a little lighter. And you've been sitting in the same place for like 30 years. So I kind of know... You know, who's over here, the, you know, the Yunksma door over there, this side, the, you know, Pixley Tipton crew that goes out. You know, I, I can kind of see you. Of course, my back row people, you know who you are. Um, thank you for moving forward when we come together. And, oh, I'm so looking forward again to be worshiping uh, together uh, corporately. And Lord willing, that's going to happen. That's going to happen soon. Uh, really, and again, and one other just little note, I have never had aspirations to be a, a TV preacher, and so I uh, feel a little uneasy about this. Um, thinking back, uh, when Susan and I first started dating, we had friends who called us uh, Jim and Tammy Faye. I, it's kind of funny, but I you know, never had, uh, yeah, never was thinking that this would happen, but here we are. And so we are in a, we are in a series uh, in Mark, and today's message is going to be coming from Mark 8, starting at 27. And so if you can get into your Bibles, um, 
however it is, I, I was very encouraged to hear uh, a lot of you getting together with uh, family and friends to, to worship together in the small kind of house church environment and um, praying that this will be a, a good day a, 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 as it has already been as we've been worshiping uh, the Lord and going to God in, in prayer. Um, so in this series called Mark, today it's marked um, by proximity. And um, before we get into that, I want to pray. So Father God, now as we go into your word, Lord, it really is our desire that you would meet us here, that you would envelop us by the power of your spirit and draw us to the truth, um, the encouragement, the, the reality of your word in our lives. And I pray that you would help me be clear uh, today in this kind of unusual kind of setting. Um, pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, we're, you know, we're in the series in, in Mark, and uh, we are in a section today. Uh, where we are going to a place um, that some of us here at TCC have been, uh, Caesarea Philippi. So we're in Mark 8, verse uh, 27. Uh, some years ago, I did a, a, a message on this, and I called it a field trip, and a field trip with Jesus. And this, it, it really is that. Jesus is taking his disciples to another, another place, and he has a very specific reason why he wants to do that, uh, and it, it has uh, implications for us as well in our call to follow Jesus in, in our day. Um, yeah, there are just some things that you can't learn in class. And so that's why, you know, we do field trips. And that's why, honestly, you know, kids within the context of your home are, are catching as much as they're learning. So they're seeing how you live and seeing how you follow Jesus. Again, in this time, it's really important that we draw together as a family and really speak into our kids' lives, especially against uh, up against the fear and the uncertainty and the anxiety made of everything else that we're seeing and hearing in culture and hoping that that's happening uh, within your family. So so it was with Jesus. He He's has his disciples, and he is getting them ready for after he leaves. And so in this case, um, uh, in, the, in this case, he's taking them up to Caesarea Philippi. Let me just give you a little context, though, before we get any further in, in the context of what, what does, what is the culture like around? I mean, again, Jesus was a Jew, and he had... Uh, he had around him Jews who responded to the culture, to the society all around them. Of course, the Romans had invaded and the Romans were the, the rulers and it was, it, was not, um, it was not a pleasant thing for the Jewish people. And so they were feeling, the Jewish people, Jesus and his disciples included, feeling the pressure to to take on the Roman ways, the Greek ways, the values, the, um, just the pattern of, of their way of, of living. And it pushed right up against what God had called them to do as far as love God only and uh, follow him only. And, and uh, so there were various responses to this, this pressure. And um, we, we feel the pressure too. I mean, again, what, what you hear from uh, the pulpit or read in the Bible or certainly at Christian schools is is much different than you see on Netflix or the movies or the news or in culture in general. And so this uh, relates to us as well, for sure. So a few things that just to think about it, they, there were main groups in the Jewish culture. Some of you know this well, but let's go back. So there's the Pharisees and the Pharisees were devout lovers of God, lovers of his way. They had a motto you know, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. And they made lots of rules to keep people away from the edge. They, they, were, they were devout, for sure. And yeah, sometimes made way too many rules. But it, it initially, at least, was to keep people away from breaking the law again and, and suffering the, um, the, the consequences of that as they had uh, previously. Uh, 
Of course, it was a heart issue, and Jesus kept pointing to them uh, for the Pharisees. There's Sadducees, and the Sadducees were, if you can't beat them, join them. And so they were, they were completely duplicitous in their living. So they would be in the morning in the, the temple and making sacrifices and such. And then in the afternoon, it would be said that they would be in the, uh, they would be in the Roman baths, naked in the Roman baths. So they were, you know, I have the fence here. So, you know, the Pharisees... You know, they, they stayed way far away from the fence. They didn't want to get on the other side over here. The, the Sadducees, you know, were sitting on the fence. They're, they would be over, you know, with the religious side during the day. In the morning, afternoon, they, they completely just went over. So they were back and forth. Maybe some of you can relate with that as well. And then we had the Essenes. If the Essenes were a group that were way out in the desert, and um, it Again, their motto was completely pull away uh, into communal life. They were separatists, and they were dedicated to asceticism. So they were they were not into the worldly pleasures at all. They had voluntary poverty, abstinence from all worldly pleasures, and they just they just flee to the hills. So I mean, again, if this is the fence, and we have the you know the Pharisees kind of away from here, you have the Sadducees on the fence. We have. You know, we have the Essenes like in Pixley. I mean, they just went, you know, way far away. And then finally we had a fourth group, and that was the Zealots. And these were sort of the the terrorists of the day. They wanted to kill the Romans, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Um, you know, that was at the extreme. But they were very zealous. They wanted the Romans out of there. And they were more uh, confrontational. They were they were fighters in in all of this. And um, again, you know, it, it it sounds all bad, but if you think about the word zealous, I mean that they were zealous. They were zealous uh, for wanting uh, God's way again. They just, uh, but they went at it uh, in a very kind of violent sort of way at times, and yeah, paid the price. Uh, uh, with their own lives uh, at time. So this may be one of times where you want to pause a moment and and think about that with whoever you're with, is each one of us kind of has that bent. We're sort of like one of those groups, just by temperament, personality. It might be interesting for you to kind of think through that. Where where do you find yourself in those four groups? And then let's, let's go on. So let's uh, read Jesus' way. We are in... Uh, Mark 8, uh, they I, just look back in your Bibles at, at Mark 8, 22. You will see that they were in Bethsaida, and they heal, uh, Jesus heals a blind man. So they are in what we call the little uh, Jewish kind of uh, holy huddle, so to speak. It's this little area, this little triangle with Capernaum and Chorazin uh, right on the Sea of Galilee that had all kinds of Jewish people. It was a comfortable place. A lot of us can relate with that. That's our church world. That's for some of us, our communities and such. But that was for them, the little holy triangle. And so they have just been there. And then verse 27, we hear this, or read this. Let's go to that, the word. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked them, who do you say that I am? Now, this is, this is a pretty quick trip. In just a few verses now, we've traveled about 40 miles to the north. And um, he's taken his disciples into pagan territory yet again. Again, an uncomfortable place. And he, he keeps doing this. Just a few weeks ago, we were across the Sea of Galilee and with the uh, uh, demon-possessed man and all the pigs. I mean, again, that tells you you're not in a, a little Jewish place for sure. Of course, we have all kinds of stories where Jesus takes his disciples and he goes right through Samaria. And um, and at, at times, like with the Samaritan woman or with the, the lepers, I mean, Jesus' proximity, you know, going to people I mean, this whole idea of like social distancing, I mean, these are, this is a new term for us, um, and, and I'm all for it. But believe me, I'm all for doing what's wise and, and what's safe, and it's, it's hard for a guy like me. I mean, as a pastor, I'd rather give you a hug, and, you know, and it, it, I'm trying to figure out how, how do we love well, how do we do this in a social distancing. In, in this case, again, proximity-wise, Jesus, of course, was wise. He never put people, you know— 
this whole disease thing. He, he, he went people, put people at risk in that regard, but he, he, he entered into that. He, he was, he, he, he brought himself close uh, to people and to the, uh, to the messes and, and such. And so, um, so anyway, that's, uh, he, he brings the people now, or he brings his disciples all the way up to um, Caesarea Philippi. The interesting thing about this is, is uh, um, it's ruled by Herod Philip, and Herod Philip is one of the uh, sons of um, Herod the, the Terrible, the one who killed the babies uh, at Jesus' birth and such, and he is built up in this area a huge marble temple dedicated to Caesar Augustus. And it, it's all about worshiping power and fame and fortune. Uh, it has right next to this marble temple, uh, a, a, a temple to the gods, little g gods of uh, Pan and of Nymph. And it's, it's as our uh, leader Tim Brown said when we were there, it was vomitous. It was all around sexuality and we get the word nymphomaniac and stuff from from that word and pandemonium it was it was everything everything evil and, and and yet Jesus brings his disciples in proximity to that with the people that are from that um from that culture uh, the other thing that would be uh, interesting for you to know is just a beautiful area it's right at the base of uh, mount hermon and um feeds that water that would come out of this big rock right there by the temple would feed into the uh, Jordan River. And if you asked a Jewish rabbi about that, there was a big opening there, and they called that the gates of hell. And Jesus makes reference to that, uh, and we see that more in the, the uh, account that we have in Matthew. So getting back to our text now, uh, verse 27 or 28, where Jesus is asking, who do people say that I am? And verse 28 says, they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others uh, say one of the prophets. And then he asks a very specific question. And Shane talked to us about this, that this is a question that we're going to have to answer. Maybe you're going to have to answer it today. Um, but he asked, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. I want you to... Turn real quick to Matthew 16, verse 17, and we'll see what uh, Jesus said. This isn't in the account of Mark, but in Matthew it says, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but my Father in heaven. And then let's continue. Let's go back to Mark, the Mark passage, verse 30. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, or other versions say Peter is pulling him aside to correct Jesus. Can you believe that? And, but when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You... Do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd. That is all the people now, the locals. He, he's gone to them now. And he calls the crowd and he says uh, to them, uh, along with the disciples, If any of you would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes to his Father's glory with his holy angels. So you know, you know the four responses of the Pharisees kind of stay away from the fence. The Sadducees on top of the fence. Okay, the the Essenes in Pixley, the the uh, Zealots who were you know among, but you know really um, reacting in some cases uh, aggressively and violently at times. And now it's time for us to really go 
and say, okay, what what is what is our what is our response uh, to all of this? Um, well, let's let's look at it. I have I have about seven things here that I think um, are going to help us get clear, I think, on what Jesus wants us to be clear about after uh, looking at this particular passage um, in regard to our response. And are we going to cave in? Are we going to just enter in? Are we going to ride the fence? Are we going to, you know, what, what are we going to do? Uh, the first thing that I believe Jesus wants to bring a lot of clarity to us on is his identity. Uh, not in, in not in a general sort of way, you know, kind of just what you sort of believe, but personally, what what do you believe uh, about Jesus? Who who do you say that I am? This may be another place you might want to pause a moment and just you know take a take a look at um, our discuss that. Who who do you say that Jesus is? What if someone came up to you right now and say, who do who do you say Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? What would be ways that you could answer it? Kids, teenagers, adults, I, I, if you would all take a chance to do that. Next one here, a second thing that I think he wants us to have some clarity about is that there is just, number two, there's no room for religious pride. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you said just a few moments ago when you're discussing this with your family, listen, I believe Jesus is my Lord and Savior. He's the Christ. He, I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus. I mean, again, all the sorts of things that you could say about him as the Savior of the world and that you've given your life to him, your heart to him, you're following him closely. Um, there isn't room for you and I to have religious pride and somehow that we are better than anybody else. You notice that in the Matthew passage, Jesus doesn't say to Peter, oh, oh Peter, you're so, you're so clever, you're smarter, you're better than everyone. No, he said, um, uh, blessed are you, Peter, um, because this wasn't revealed to you by man, but by my Father. We know that the Lord is the one who draws people to himself, and he, if he's done that for you, then, then uh, the posture is one of humility and, and certainly uh, gratitude uh, to the Lord. And that changes the way then we look, uh, certainly, at other people. Um, we're not thinking down on them. We're just saying we need to bring uh, this good news to them both in word, but also in action. And third thing, he wants us to uh, have some clarity on where, where the power comes to do all of this. And we really see this as Jesus is talking about his death, but not just his death and the suffering he's going to have, but then the resurrection as well, that in three days he was going to rise so that death could not hold them. And so in just a, a few weeks, we're going to be celebrating Easter. And again, there's no power like resurrection power in in our lives um, again sometimes we don't think that way sometimes we think no it, it's by our own cleverness or by our own strategies and things like that but no that's not where the power comes now we do our best and such but I just wonder what was Peter saying to him what what was he trying to correct Jesus on and uh, you see Jesus's reaction as far as get behind me Satan that must have been wow what a what a blow that must have been. But he was just pointing out to Peter, he points out to us as well, that sometimes we, we kind of enter into how the world thinks, how the culture thinks, and starts, and we get lost in that. We start thinking like man instead of thinking the thoughts of what God has. And a lot of way, times his ways are, are not our ways, and they are not always so intuitive uh, as well. But for sure, the power is going to come uh, from, from him. Uh, a fourth uh, point of clarity uh, that comes out of this passage, at least for me, is that this call from Jesus to follow him, to follow him into other places, is just not going to be a comfortable kind of safe uh, following. It's, it has risk in it, and it's, uh, it's certainly not all about us. It's not all about me. It's about, about him and his, his ways. And so, you know, we need to hear that again in, in our culture. We need to hear that today, that we're, we're following Jesus. He has a way, even in all the hard things that are happening and, and the anxiety and the uncertainty that we all face, that we are going to follow Jesus and his ways into it. 
and, and then be used by the Lord as we, as we follow him closely and, and walk in his way and walk in his, weird, in his word. And clearly, one place that you're, you're really going to shine, you're, you're really going to stand out, is if you, um, again, are not, you are not living and reacting out of fear. This is, uh, yeah, this is something we see in Jesus. He just is in faith always, not, not in fear. He goes into hard places, even at his own demise at times. But he, he uh, he's just, he's not afraid. He's full of, of faith. And so, yeah, in these days, we have uncertainties. There's questions that we all have about how this is going to impact uh, our, our communities, our, our friends, our family, um, our our bank account, our businesses, all, all of these kinds. And we're thinking about that too, for sure, but just not to give in to fear. I quoted uh, yesterday, 2 Timothy 1, that again, this promise that God, he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and sound mind or self-discipline. And, and we want to most definitely walk and live out of that. And oh, the Lord bless us as we do that and help us by his spirit to do that. And then a fifth, uh, moving very quickly now, is we, we have uh, clarity, a, a little greater clarity, what it means to follow him. And he says it's going to mean a couple of things, that we're going to deny ourselves and that we're going to take up our cross and, and then uh, follow him. This is, this is staggering. This is a time of Lent. Maybe some of you have given up something and you're finding that's difficult. I, I mean, this is an all the, to, all, the, all the time sort of thing. What does it mean? And this may be another thing to discuss within your, within your uh, fellowship uh, worship group today, is what does it mean to, to deny yourself? What would you deny yourself for the sake of the gospel, the sake of loving God well, you know, getting vertical, and then loving, loving your neighbors and your friends? What are you willing to deny yourself of? We're not too we're not too uh, quick to do that. And again, this is something that Jesus is holding up for us to deny ourselves. And then to take up our cross. I mean, again, it had to hit those disciples so hard when they were remembering back to what Jesus said. And then after the death and resurrection of Jesus and seeing what that really meant for Jesus to take up his cross. I, I, um, I can imagine the conversations they had. And then you really see their willingness to do that as they went out into um, Asia Minor and started sharing the gospel and were persecuted and were, were challenged at every front. And they, they understood a little more clearly what it meant to, to take up uh, their cross. Uh, a sixth clarity, uh, again, that the gospel will advance. This thing that Jesus said about the gates of hell not, not prevailing. At first, I, all these years, I thought that meant that we had to kind of close ourselves off so that, you know, the gates of hell were, you know, we, we kept people out. And Dr. Brown really helped me understand, helped us understand that, no, we advance. We, we follow Jesus and, and the gates of hell aren't going to prevail. The love is going to win. The, the gospel of Jesus is is going to is going to win and so again it's going to advance the gospel is going to advance again we're you know jesus didn't wait for all the people around caesarea philippi and all that to come to little holy triangle he went to them and we see this with jesus all the time that he goes to people he brings his disciples and really the the disciples did get it they you know after the death and resurrection of jesus they went out and they went out into these pagan cultures, and again, despite all the resistance, all the all the struggle, the the gospel, the gospel advanced. The church grew. They they got it, and I hope uh, that we that we get it as, um, as we get it as well. And then this finally, um, this last statement that uh, Jesus makes in here, if anyone's ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in all his Father's glory with his holy angels. Again, the, the fence is, you know, if you're sitting on the fence, you know, uh, 
it's not only uncomfortable, but it's a, it's a very dangerous place to be. And I'm calling you in this day, and to myself as well, to be all in for Jesus, just completely sold out for him. And again, um, bold and brave and courageous in our uh, following of him. Uh, just a, a last couple comments and then we'll pray. And that is for some kind of further discussion with your group. Uh, you may want to look at John 17. Something that really comes into play here is what does it mean to be called into the world by Jesus and but not of it? You know, not not entering into it, but to but to be actively in it. And in John 17, 13 to 19, we have these words. I am coming to you. This is Jesus's prayer for you today and for me. I'm coming to you now, he says to the Father. But I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I'm not of the world, says Jesus. And then verse 17, sanctify them by the truth, your word. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Did you get that? As I was sent in the world, Jesus says, now Jesus is saying, I am sending you into the world. This is his prayer. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. So that may be a good discussion. And a, a final one is in 1 Peter 2, 11 to 12. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12. And this, again, what that looks like in, in our own uh, day. Um, when we look back in history, some of you history buffs know that, you know, in other times where uh, there were pandemics and, uh, uh, and such, that Christians were really identified as those people that, you know, that were really helped, that they were part of the solution, that they were uh, they were really identified. They, it, it really caught people's attention and it helped actually Christianity uh, grow. I came across a sociologist, Rodney Stark, who, who makes, uh, makes a couple of these comments about Christians in some of those times, uh, second and third century, mid-second, mid-third uh, century uh, epidemics, that Christians cared well for one another. They really loved each other well leading to greater survival rates, number one. Um, and then it also uh, increased the proportion of Christians in urban centers who had contact with people then. And then second of all, that Christians cared for non-Christians, bringing these non-believers into the sphere of Christian influence. And again, it, it made impact. And third, this I found this very interesting. Christians stayed to care for others while pagan elites fled, which combined with paganism's inability to protect its adherents from illness, exposed the bankruptcy of pagan religion. Uh, Stark cites that a number of pagan sources complaining about the good reputation Christians were gaining just because of their action of loving well. Oh, that we would love each other well, love our community well through all of this and walk in faith and love. Let me pray. Father, thanks so much for our time in the word. I pray now that the discussions that would be had among family and small groups would again um, put your word into action in our lives. And, and I pray that you will find us faithful, loving well, living courageously, living for you, Lord Jesus, in a way that draws people to you. In Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen.